Succession. Who on Succession is most camp? Tom. Um, or Roman or Cherry, maybe. I feel like, is Cherry camp? And like a girl boss and like a dominatrix <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh yeah I, I would yeah I think Tom for me because he is so like at least through my vision he's a character that is so completely in denial of everything he is that it's hilarious um which I mean goes for Roman as well uh in a certain way I think Roman, there's something about Tom that's just really incomprehensible yeah <laughs> yeah and I, th- I think Matthew McFadden's like line delivery and how like his American accent is good, but it's unsettling. It's very unsettling. Um, oh, it's it's just aw- it's like there's just something about it that's just a little like <laughs> can't it, there's a poshness like- to it that could yes. just be the character or it could be the the Britishness yeah. slipping through. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think when it, whenever he comes on screen and goes on one of his rants, it's just so, it's so funny because he he's knows. on so many levels. He's on it so really, many levels of stupidness. It really is fun because that uh, Tom is a character, I feel like, that is so, yeah, he, he's like you said, like so unaware of him himself and like all of that layers. But like, as an actor, like McFadden mu- must know like all of those layers right it's so intentional yeah okay should we get into the the main topic (laughs) i would love to hello and welcome to it's giving camp i'm saffron and uh, i'm fabiola and today we have our second guest uh hi my name's amparo um i am a friend film scholar uh person trying to break into the industry at some point uh and i am a self-proclaimed trekkie which is very helpful for today's topic star trek yay so we this was uh, initially proposed as a let's look at the original series and then you were like actually i kind of really like you know, next generation to Deep Space Nine more. So can we talk about that some? So we will get, we'll talk about, um, we we watched one episode of Deep Space Nine and then I'm sure there's also just- The Deep Space Nine one is still kind of original Star Trek though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I chose it very purposefully because it's an episode that is giving its own commentary and tribute to the original series. Yeah. And I did not realize there, I mean, I knew that there, there are some time travel and time shenanigans in Star Trek, but as someone who loves time travel, I was like, ooh, this is, this is well executed. This is fun. Um, I, great, I quite enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, what, the specific episodes we watched were um, from the original series, Amok Time, Trouble with Tribbles, and then we watched the Trials and Tribble Patients. From Deep Space Nine. Um, where do we want to start? Because there's so much here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I would love to hear you guys' uh, opinions about the episodes we watched. Did you enjoy them? What did you think? I I enjoyed them. I um, I think the only Star Trek I'd watched before this was like for class, like for some sci-fi classes that I've taken. And in this context where I was like, I'm watching this to have fun. I had fun. And, um, cause I don't think I had really ever gotten like the point before. I was like, yeah, I know this is a show that everyone loves, but whatever. Um, but especially in these episodes that we watched, I was like, oh, oh, I see why people ship Spock and Kirk. I, sh- I see it. Um, and also for some reason I had it in my mind that Kirk was like this really like stoic, loyal like captain and i'm like oh he's like the sassiest motherfucker on enterprise like (laughs) he is not taking anyone's shit it's super funny (laughs) yeah i think kirk is a character that gets um mischaracterized a lot even by fans and by people who have never seen it similar waves of mischaracterization 
Yeah, I also thought the episodes were fun and it was like particularly fun to watch um, the Deep Space Nine episode and to just like, just see them change into the old outfits and just enter the old Enterprise and everything. Yeah. And like, I also particularly love the, the classic Star Trek bright colors and bright lighting and to see that shift in Deep Space Nine was really fun. Yeah, um, one of the things I wanted to bring up is that Deep Space Nine is probably of like the uh, pre-reboot Star Trek shows is probably the darkest by far, the grittiest, um, the one that Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, would have probably hated if he was alive because it goes against so many of his original ideals. So seeing a show like this, this one pay tribute to the original series in such a deep way is very interesting because um, of this conflict within them. Yeah, that's interesting because it's clearly like there's such admiration for the original concept, the original characters the like story beats like also that's that's one of the things i want to say off the bat uh tribbles are my new favorite fantasy creature they are so dumb i love them <laughs> so much and just the multiple in both triple episodes there's just the shots where there's just like some stuck to the wall is my the funniest thing to me because it's it's part of, I think, the, like, the artifice of it, where it's like, you can tell these are just like these little like fluff balls that they are just like sticking in places. And like in some shots, especially in the original series, they'll be holding it. And I'm like, there maybe they'll put in like the sound, like the purring sound effect where I'm like, this looks like you could like just this looks so it doesn't look like a real animal it looks so fake but then it's such love and such tenderness it cracks me up and i love it i want more of them i want every show to include include triples <laughs> um yeah uh i think in the the reboot star trek movies the 2009 one uh the sequel uh was it also called Star Trek Into Darkness? Star Trek Into oh, Darkness. Yeah. The one that was very controversial because they got Benedict Cumberbatch to play Khan instead of, um, you know, an actor that wasn't a white British man to play Khan because, you know, in the original uh, films, he had been uh, portrayed by a, I think, was it Ricardo Montalban? Yeah, so he was played originally by Ricardo Montalban, who is a uh, Latino actor, uh, even though the character I think was supposed to be South Asian. So uh, all around very conflicting things with Khan, but a lot of people were annoyed that they didn't even consider casting an actor of color to play uh, Khan instead of got a white guy. Anyways, what I was getting to was at the end of that movie, Kirk is saved through triple blood, like a triple blood transfusion, if I remember correctly. I've only seen it once, but I think that is so funny because it's a movie that takes itself so seriously and which is one of my problem with the new Star Trek's new Star Trek shows and media in general it takes itself way too seriously and then at the end it's like oh Tribbles saved Captain Kirk. <laughs> That's so like do they even ever show them? Yeah, it it shows I don't I don't I don't remember how they got the Tribble in the first place, but at the end it shows like a Tribble like hooked up to like uh <laughs> like a triple with like an iv <laughs> something like that it was crazy um but anyways trouble with tribbles is my favorite episode of the original series and so is and amok time is like so iconic that i couldn't not have it i would say trouble with tribbles and amok time are like my two favorites even though how they're you... oh i'm trying to remember how you described amok time to us because i had not heard of it before I feel like maybe the concept was vaguely familiar, but you were just like, um, what did you say? You were like, I'm trying to find how you described it. Uh, oh yeah, you were like, Amok Time is the intradition of Ponfar, aka Vulcan sex, where Kirk and Spock fight until Spock isn't horny anymore. And I was like, what? 
What? And it happened exactly as I said it, didn't it? It did. You're right. <laughs> yeah, um, it's truly a spectacular episode. And it is also the first episode of season two of Star Trek, the original series, which only had a three season run and was on the verge of cancellation all the time because it actually had a very high budget. Um, and Gene Roddenberry very quickly learned that he could weaponize fans to get the studio to uh, uh, sign off on more episodes um, because they were very dedicated and would do these crazy letter writing campaigns that, to the studios. Um, so imagine being a fan of Star Trek in the 60s and you went on a letter writing campaign to save the show and you're just sitting down and you're going to watch the premiere of season two of your favorite show and it's a muck time like what would go through your head I mean like yeah fans must have already been shipping the two of them right so like yeah that's it must be like Okay, here's the thing that I find so interesting in thinking about, like, Slash and, like, in modern context especially, I feel like there's always, like, when it gets introduced that the, 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 two, the two male characters that fans love to pair together and a female character gets introduced to be paired with one of them. Fans are obviously usually very upset about that. Um, but I love that in this episode, over the course of this episode, they introduce her uh, to Pring and, yes. and, and Spock's like, she's my wife. And everyone's like, <gasps> and then over the course of the episode, almost immediately, she's like, I'm not interested in Spock. And I actually want this guy Kirk to like fight, for, <laughs> fight him for me. And it's like, wow. They really just introduced this female character to push the two male characters even closer together and create even more tension between the two of them, I, which I find really interesting. I'm also just obsessed with T'Pring's makeup. It's stunning. It's gorgeous. <laughs> the whole aesthetics of this ritual, I was like, man, this is- The red sky. <laughs> what I wrote what did I write down uh my notes I was like uh super complicated rituals feel camp because I can't understand this shit but it looks pretty <laughs> yeah and I think the funniest thing to me about that is that they did that and then the writers of all the re- the rest of the shows were like fuck this is what Vulcan is now we have to make lore about this crazy ritual that they probably put two seconds of thought into and we have to make it like impressive or whatever the concept of just being like you are supposed to be completely like no feelings and then you suddenly get so horny that you either have to like immediately have sex or fight people is so it's so exaggerated it's so ridiculous i mean as soon as you introduce a character who's like i am emotionless like i use logic only all the audiences want all the audience is going to want to see is that character broken down emotional and i think that the all the star trek writers when they have that character the Spock character, which I mean, gets recreated as Data in the the Next Generation and Odo in Deep Space Nine, kind of. Um, they are just itching to get that character to break down and become emotional. Um, which I think, you know, it's I, the 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 shot of Spock where he has his hands together and has his eyes rolled up like like this yeah <laughs> incredibly camp incredibly ca- like oh he's he's fighting the blood fever yeah. <laughs> do not attempt to speak with him kirk he is deep in the black tall the blood fever he will not speak with thee again until he has passed through what is to come if he wishes to depart, he may leave now. I, I was going to say that, like, because people are just so used to Spock being, like, 
very low key and logical and calm. And then very suddenly in this episode, just being out of control. It's just very fun. It well, is. I was like, it, early on, there's like the shot when he's like talking to Kirk on the ship and he's like clutching like a knife or something behind his back. I was like, what is going on here? Spock is ready. He's ready. Um, yeah, I, I think Spock is a character. We actually do see him emote so much throughout the show. Like, again, they're just itching for the opportunity to show that he has emotion. And I mean, he does like any time, especially in his relationship with uh, Bones, uh, Leonard McCoy, the doctor on the ship, he is incredibly <laughs> sassy towards him. And like, you know, it's logical, but it's still emotional. He still wants to one up McCoy. And that's something that you see through all Vulcan characters in all the shows. Like they say that they're logical and emotional, but they're fucking rude um, and sassy uh, all the time. I mean, Spock, like compared to some of the other Vulcan characters is you know, less emotive than them, but I still think that he's highly emotive, um, especially compared with a character like Data in The Next Generation, who truly, like, all his emotions are, like, very construed, and, you know, he's completely blank-faced all the time. Um, I think the comparison of Spock and Data, very interesting, but since we didn't watch TNG, I didn't, I don't want to get into it. Um, he also but, likes yes. the Tribbles in the Tribble episode. Yes. <laughs> yes, he's enchanted by them. <laughs> they calm him down. Uh, yeah, I think one of my main points about camp and Star Trek is that these shows, like the original series especially, also DS9, they really want you to buy into the fantasy of Star Trek. They don't have the highest budget. Um, they don't have like the best costumes or the best effects or anything, but they expect the audience. They show the audience these things and they're like, okay, you have to believe it. And that's, I think, something that the newer shows lack um, because they have the budget, they have the crazy effects. So they don't expect you to buy into it. So they try and prove it to you. They try and prove, oh, well, this is because blah, 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 and that, and da, da, da. And no, we don't need that. You can just give us these things and we will believe in them. Um, I think like in- that makes makes it less charming. Yeah, I exactly. Think, and that's like exactly like I think the point of why I love the triples, where it's like, yeah. yeah, this isn't like the special effects or whatever. It's not that complicated or intense, and sometimes it doesn't even look that good. But because all of the characters never question it, and all the characters like are so invested in like the it seems like even the actors are having so much fun that i'm like yeah this is fun this is in it, it it lets it be a little silly i i love the scene with uhura where she like first sees one it, it's such a good scene because like you believe that she does love this little thing yeah and it's like it's like, oh, I do, it does look really soft. It does look like it purrs. Like, I do think, I maybe I want a triple to hold myself. <laughs> yeah, and alongside that, the Klingons, who are utterly disgusted by them and, like, can't get even close to them, is also hilarious in camp because, I mean, like, the characters on the show, they think it's funny, um, and we think it's funny, too. And that kind of, I think, another thing which I really appreciate about trials and tribulations is the Klingons in it because so basically if you don't know the Klingons got this big redesign for the Star Trek movies in the 70s um they got like prosthetics heavy makeup um a lot of I have a lot of issues with this Klingon redesign but it's just what it was um and so Worf who is a character from the next generation and uh, Deep Space Nine is a Klingon and he goes back in time and he visits uh, the the um, the TOS era and he sees these Klingons who just look like human guys with beards. Well, and it's I think it's even the 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 other like Worf's like uh, crewmates because they're like yeah. they're like 
the waiter is like, oh, don't, you know, don't order this obscure coffee again. You know, the Klingons keep ordering it. And they're like, where are the Klingons in this yeah. room? <laughs> yeah. Um, but the explanation that Worf gives and he's like, we don't talk about it. We don't want, I don't want to talk yeah. about it. <laughs> is so perfect because it doesn't like, I feel like so many like the new Trek shows and um, like, you know, big science fiction fantasy um, mediums in general, they just have to explain the joke to you. They ex- they want to like get into it and be like, huh. like, I'm just thinking about the stupid, like every time that there's a new Marvel superhero introduced and they have a kind of silly name, they're like, huh, why is there someone called blah, 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 you know? And they explain the joke and you don't, you don't have to explain the joke if the joke is strong enough to stand on its own. And sometimes they also would just shove lore into the the decision. It's like, you don't need to do that. (laughs) Yeah, you can just be like, yeah, this is funny. Worf doesn't want to talk about it. (laughs) And also, okay, I do, one of the things that is somewhat explained is that Worf does then explain why, like, um, Klingons and Tribbles hate each (laughs) other. But, like, in the explanation, it becomes more of a joke because it's like, oh, we have these great, we had these great war parties to send out to fight the triples. And it's like, you just up the, ex- you up the anti, you up the exaggeration. Like, yeah, that is ridiculous. But on some level, it makes sense because clearly the Tribbles are an ecological disaster and they are a constant problem that they have to, like, deal with. It's been my observation that most humanoids love soft, furry animals, especially if they make pleasing sounds. They do nothing but consume food and breed. If you feed that thing more than the smallest morsel in a few hours, you'll have ten Tribbles, then a hundred, then a thousand. Calm down. They were once considered mortal enemies of the Klingon Empire. This? A mortal enemy of the Empire? They were an ecological menace, a plague to be wiped out. Wiped out? What are you saying? Hundreds of warriors were sent to track them down throughout the galaxy. An armada obliterated the Triple Home World. By the end of the 23rd century, they had been eradicated. Another glorious chapter of Klingon history. Tell me, do they still sing songs of the great Tribble hunt? It was so insane when they said that they put a bomb in a Tribble. <laughs> like, I was like, what? It's like, might as well. Might as well. Which makes the original episode so much funnier because I'm just like, it's from the point of view of like Kirk and Spock. Um, and like they're just interacting randomly with these tribbles and in the whole time i'm just like pre- imagining like the crew of ds9 like in the background being like oh my god <laughs> it's also like the visuals of them like holding up they're like we have to scan them by hand and they're like holding up the tribble and then they just toss it behind them and i'm like this looks like such a pointless task because there's so many you're filled the entire gray locker is filled with these like and they're not like they don't have like the effects to like make every single one of these little fluff balls move so you know they're really just like tossing these clearly like props they they look like plushies they just look like stuffed animals i think um like at any comic-con that you go to there will always be like a stand selling tribbles that are just like little balls of fur that if you squeeze them they have like a noise box in them and they like purr go you know um so yeah i think they've become so iconic in star trek and it's because they're so fake looking and like crunchy uh i think another example of this is i think one of the early episodes have you guys seen the unicorn dog i don't think so I have seen I, I, I've I, seen pictures of the unicorn dog. Yeah, it's it's um, a dog. It's <laughs> a dog that they put like a like a fur coat on it and then stuck a unicorn horn on its forehead and Spock is holding it and talking about how it's a dangerous alien. Um like a very it's not even like a big dog. It's a small dog. It's like this big. Um so it's it's like you know, it, it again, it wants you to buy into it. And that's what makes it camp because you're like, sure, this is an alien. 
this can be an alien anything can be an alien and you get that in the later shows as well where like they started putting in like prosthetics and like you know trying to make characters look more alien but it's clearly just a guy with a thing on his forehead a usually like very either phallic or yonic thing on his forehead um, at the Klingons <laughs> which is the least of my concern with the Klingon design they should have gone farther in with that and less with the painting white uh, actors in very dark paint for th- all these shows um but yeah and that that itself gets changed in the new Star Trek shows in Discovery. They get like the Klingons once again get redesigned. And I think it's a better redesign, but again, it just looks, it looks too good. (laughs) They made the prosthetics look too good. Um, And I think like there's no, it doesn't want us to buy into it. It's just showing us these very impressive looking alien prosthetics, which look impressive, but I'm like, this isn't my Klingons. I appreciate the redesign that's a lot more thoughtful of what you're putting on the screen, but these aren't the Klingons. I, 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 wanna, I want it to look like a guy in heavy makeup and prosthetics. I think part of um, camp, which is part of some sci-fi, especially like early Star Trek, is it's not just about like the story and like how the story looks. It's the whole experience. It's the whole process of watching it and knowing that it is constructed is part of the fun. And I think, um, you know, if you want like deep sci-fi, you know, hard science fiction lore, I mean, there was plenty of that at the time. If I remember, like, wasn't, like, some of Asimov's writing what inspired, like, certain episodes of, like, original Star Trek and and stuff like that. But once it translates, once you go to the visual medium, especially if you you don't have, like, the budget or, like, just the technology at the (laughs) time, you can't get to this, like, you know, perfect, like as real life world and so you what's more fun is to lean into it to mm-hmm. lean into the fact that it can't look perfect like to me it's not even like just about how like they clearly don't have like the money we have today or the money to like make things look believable but like even if if they did a uh, star trek still looks uniquely star trek in like the color scheme and the lighting like you don't need a ton of money to like have the star trek color story (laughs) totally i mean this is like i think the how technology is represented in the original series um like i love just the fact that it's like that is a bunch of flashing lights that they've they've strapped onto you know some like piece of plastic and it looks great it's colorful it's fun it makes you know the bridge is a fun background but i think like that's part of one of the reasons i loved the the trials and tribulations too was then like seeing the how the technology has like evolved between the shows and the time periods where where it's like like when the characters walk into the like the elevator thing and they're like floor nine and they just announce it and it doesn't work and they're like well why does it work and then it's like someone comes up and they grab this like random looking lever and then they're like floor nine and it's like oh that's how it's supposed to work but it's like those two things aren't it's not like any of them are more sophisticated and then you get like the at one point i think like um yeah, like they, they tap the... Yeah, Cisco taps his comm badge. That doesn't look any less... It just looks like you're patting your chest. But oh no, actually I need to pull out this like, this fancy phone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's interesting because they're making commentary about like this like low tech stuff, but with like a lot of admiration. You have the shot of Dax like caressing the old tricorder and being like, oh, the leather finish and yeah. stuff. And you have all this appreciation. But at the same time, outside the show, 
they were using extremely high tech techniques at the time to get these characters into the old show. Like, I was gonna say it looks really good. I'm it's like, very <laughs> impressive. Do you know how they did that? I'm like, it looks so, it, it, all of it looks seamless. The fact that it's like, they are in the background of this shot that looks like that's, that must, it looks like that was, the shot was just filmed that way, even though, you know, an hour or so before I had watched the original episode where it was like, yeah. they had work in the background and then, because the, the actors obviously weren't the actors then, but. Yeah, I think a lot of it, part of it was like they recreated parts of the, the original set, tried to get as close as possible. And then through editing, they kind of mashed it together. I think a lot of stuff was like, they took half of the shot from the original series and then mm -hmm. meshed it with their set. So it wasn't like they got put into the background. It's like they got put into the side that they had constructed, something yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, a lot of work and effort went into it and it took up a lot of the budget for that season. So I think there's some episodes that, you know, suffer as a result of having like this gorgeous, like caring, meticulous episode like Trials and Tribulations. Um, Season five of Deep Space Nine is like very funny to me. It's like, like it's very much ramping up because there's um, the war storyline in Deep Space Nine, which is an ongoing seasonal storyline, you know, typical of cult television, which it has the episodic stuff, but then the overarching uh, storyline is that there's this war brewing between the Federation uh, and the Klingons who are on the same side. And then the, um, the Dominion, and the Cardassians who are on the same side. Um, and, but at the same time, you have these extremely goofy episodes. Uh, and then if you noticed uh, Colonel Kira, or she, she's not a Colonel at that time, I don't think, whatever, um, Major Kira, right. Major Kira, if you see she's pregnant in the shots that she's in. So in that season, this is a bit of background. So the actress who played Kira, uh, non, uh, Nana Visitor, um, got um, pregnant and the way that it, they explained it in the show was that she was taking, uh, she was returning from a conference with Bashir, the doctor, and Keiko O'Brien, who is a another character on the show who was pregnant with a child at the time. And they get into an accident and Keiko gets hurt. So the only thing Bashir can do to save the child is to transfer the baby into Kira's body. And that's how they explain why Kira all of a sudden is very pregnant throughout <laughs> all of season five of Deep Space Nine. And a lot of people hated this and talked about how Deep Space Nine is turning into a soap opera with these pregnancy plots and all the stuff about the characters' relationships. Because I think, I'm not sure when, but... I think in season five, Jadzia and Worf also start dating. Um, and so there's a lot, so much of Deep Space Nine is about in characters' relationships with each other and how dramatic they can get and like how they can dislike each other, which was something that was not allowed in uh, the original series and TNG because one of Roddenberry's visions was like, oh, it's the future, everyone has to be friends. And Deep Space Nine was like, no, these bitches hate each other. <laughs> But yeah, and I think kind of, I think the biggest camp aspect of Deep Space Nine is how dramatic and soap opera-y some episodes can get. And some of these actors, like I love Avery Brooks as uh, Captain Sisko, but he has some crazy deliveries of his lines. <laughs> he, he gets so loud and bombastic, very similar to Shatner himself, which I mean, I think that they're both very comparable um, captains uh, because you have Kirk who's like always going down with the landing crew and putting himself directly in danger constantly. And then there's a break from that with Picard who was like, you know, very thoughtful and he, he thinks things through and he avoids violence. And then you go to Cisco, who he's my favorite captain. He, I think he's incredible. I think he's written in such a deep way, but he's also, he's kind of a return to Kirk. You have a, it's, he's a captain that's very intelligent but he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. And he will. Another thing that I found really fun about Trials and Tribulations is that, like, not only is the visual aesthetic of the two shows really different, but also they, they were made in different decades. So not only do they have to, like, change how everything looks, but also adjust it so, like, the characters look like 
the from the 60s yeah and I just love that I love how 60s the show is yeah one of my favorite moments in the trials and tribulations episode was when they were changing into the the costumes and um what's the whatever her name is their name yeah it was like uh they're like oh like these you know men were or like lieutenants wore this color or whatever and then she comes out and she's like and women wear less and does like the little like twirl and pose i'm like yes <laughs> like because you don't have to be i think in in like maybe like in a modern show it might be like why am i wearing like this sexy skimpy outfit and it's like no have fun with it be flirty yeah Captain. Huh. Lieutenant, actually, I didn't want to push my luck. Looks good in you, sir. Thank you, Ensign. Wait a minute, aren't you two wearing the wrong color? Don't you know anything about this period in time? I'm a doctor, not an historian. In the old days, operations officers wore red, command officers wore gold. And women wore less. I think I'm going to like history. Uh, something I would really like to discuss is like in the original series, just like the misogyny and the sexism in those oh. episodes, especially Amok Time. And yeah. like now I just look at them and I think it adds to the camp value um, of like, you now own this woman um, in Amok Time. And, but yeah, and I think that actually watching these episodes like people will just go out and say oh star trek was so feminist for its time and all that and i disagree um i think it was making strides but it's like absolutely a sexist product of its time um but yeah i was wondering what you guys thought of that yeah i mean the the actual like pawn far with to i didn't feel like because even though there are lines like you now own this woman and stuff like mm -hmm. that, she felt like she had so much agency in that, mm -hmm. where the fact that she challenged, that she thought through the she entire- She had a whole strategy. Yeah, she had she a did. whole, she was like, I know what I want and I know how to get it. And she's like, the, you know, and I thought that was like so interesting. Um, but who I felt suffered um in that episode was the other nurse the, chapel yeah nurse chapel and i really like was uncomfortable with the way like spock talked to her and the fact like the throwing of the um soup and being and then later he's like you know a woman he tells kirk he's like uh, you know a woman shouldn't do that you know he, she wouldn't a woman shouldn't serve a man unless it's her husband or something and it's like okay she doesn't seem to have much character outside of like being infatuated with spock like that definitely to me but i honestly i noted it but it didn't it didn't disrupt my enjoyment of the show because i'm like yeah that's what it is that's that's the time yeah um i think a lot of the time Spock's indifference or outright misogyny towards women gets read as him being gay, which I think is really funny. And also, like, if you put a compilation of all the times that Spock has been rude to a woman or like spurned her, it really seems like he's gay. Um, but I, something that actually disquiets me is that, like, in a lot of the new Trek stuff, like, Spock is his love interest is Nurse Chapel. And um, at least I think in. Well, in the uh, 2009 J.J. Abrams films, his love interest is uh, Uhura, um, which mm, I don't okay. like, but whatever. And Do I they think in have Spring like a lot of in is there is, are they more of like a dynamic in original series? In the episodes we watch, they don't really like. I clearly remembered an interview with J.J. Abrams where he was like, oh, I just put them together because she's the only woman and I wanted a love interest for Spock. And then and then he said, oh, and then I actually went back and watched this episode where like they're uh, dancing and singing together and they do have a bit of chemistry. So that was great. So it's like it was very much like he didn't realize that they actually did have a bit of chemistry in the past. Um, 
So yeah, and I think in Strange New World, he's getting put, I haven't seen Strange New Worlds yet, so nothing to say. And I've also heard that it's a step in the right direction for New Trek because it's kind of returning to like the campiness and like the silly episodes and kind of the lack of uh, uh, overlying plot guiding the season through, which is one of my big problems with um, New Trek. Too much plot. Um, <laughs> but I think he's getting put with Nurse Chapel, which I think is an interesting choice. Um, also, the, the, just the sentence of she's the only woman and I wanted to put in a love interest is, is just insane. <laughs> I'm going to look up that interview. I mean, we look, we all know J.J. Abrams is, I think he's a better producer than anything else. Like, just, J.J. just knows how to set up a story and yeah. nothing else. Um, I think uh, there, I think he said, he's, I think the most heinous thing he said about Star Trek, well, first of all, he was never a Star Trek fan. He just got given the movies. He, which, I mean, I'm technically, I don't have anything wrong with that, but like, he was very much like, oh, I was a Star Wars guy. Like Star Trek was too, I was dumb. Star Trek was too smart for me or something. Uh, like kind of be, being very bro -y about it. And it's like, Star Trek was not smart for anyone. It's a stupid show. Um, but anyways, his whole thing was like, oh, women didn't want to, we're probably not going to want to come and see uh, the 2009 Star Trek movie. So I had this scene at the beginning where Kirk's mom dies protecting his body or like his like we're giving birth or something like that so women would be invested in what star trek i swear i remember reading this expert excerpt of an interview and i was like yeah the, the best buddy. way to get women interested is to fridge the mom <laughs> yeah um crazy as if women weren't the reason that star trek exists yeah <laughs> that's that is Wow, wait, yeah, he really doesn't know his Star Trek history, he did, huh? He did not, he did not, um, which is why I, I actually very much enjoy Star Trek Beyond, which was the third of the reboot films, um, directed by Justin Lin, who did, uh, I think, some of the Fast and the Furious movies and stuff like that, hmm. because it's not trying, it's, it embraces kind of the silliness of Star Trek a lot better than any J.J. Um, Abrams film did. Um, still not, it's still very different from the, my ideal Star Trek vibe, which is DS9 era Star Trek. Um, but. So closer. I have a question then, if you, if you like, you're describing, you find the, the, like too much plot, something that's really frustrating, but you also have described to us that DS9 is, is one of like the most political of the, sh of the Star Trek shows. So how do you, um balance that how do you how do you find like what about ds9 interests you even yeah. though it is like can be quite serious yeah so i think the main difference is good writing um i think that the political stuff in ds9 is very well written and but also the thing with new trek especially star trek discovery which i tried really hard to enjoy and i've watched most of it i haven't seen the new season yet but I don't really want to because every single season it starts off like oh let's get to know these characters and then it's like the fate of the universe lies in the hands of these this crew and these characters while deep space nine kind of it sees the whole conflict as like something that's beyond these characters that these characters find themselves in the center of this conflict especially cisco who is like the emissary of the prophets and he like carries out and he does a lot in the war effort, but he himself, he's just one captain in a fleet of the entire Federation, which is gigantic. And it understands how large the Star Trek universe is. While New Trek is very much like, they're the only hope and the fabric of the universe is in their hands. And the plot gets so complicated that it's impossible to follow while Deep Space Nine, like although the setup is complicated because you have all these like different political stuff, things going on, it's relatively easy to follow episode to episode. Um, in addition to that, I think that Discovery doesn't really have any 
political things going on. It's a, it's very physical. It's a very physical show. It's like violence and action. And we have to go there and blow this guy up and find this thing and da, da, da. And all the stuff while Deep Space Nine is like, oh, we have to go and we have to talk to these people and we have to resolve this conflict and we have to um, make sure that the balance is maintained. That mm. kind of stuff, um, which... Also, disclaimer, I think that Discovery has a lot of potential as a show. I love the characters in Discovery. I just think the writing is so cringe at some time, at some points, yeah. Follow-up question. Do you think that that idea of, like, we're the only ones who can save the universe can be, like, camp? Or is it a matter of, like, how much is taken seriously? Huh. I feel like it... It just depends on like how aware the writers are of like the the saving the whole world trope is just used all the time. Yeah, yeah I agree. What have you done? Did you hire someone to kill him? Did you sabotage the Enterprise? Nothing so mundane. Let's just say that Kirk's death will have a certain poetic justice to it. <laughs> he put a bomb in a treble. I'm trying to find. There's so much. I feel like there's so much more to talk about. Fabiola, did was there anything that you wanted to um, bring up and steer our conversation to directly related to the episodes that we watched? Um, I I wrote down um, a, kind of something that Spock said in the trouble with tribbles in which he's he like wants to focus on practicality and doesn't see the tribbles as super practical and i i feel like that is a really camp aspect of the tribbles is that they they kind of just exist and people love them for just existing even though there is arguably zero like use for them <laughs> Yeah. And the fact that they're actively detrimental, you know? <laughs> and like also that juxtaposition of something that's like really cute, but it also is like will probably lead to danger is also like very camp. I also, I will say, I had heard, you know, I've heard of the triples before. Um, I was under the impression, having never watched the episode, that the entire plot was about the Tribbles. Like, I thought, like, for some reason the plot was just that these, like, fluffy animals, like, take over the ship. Um, you know, not intentionally, but just they multiply, multiply, multiply. So I found the fact that, like, they were able to, like, the, the Tribbles were actually, like, uh, necessary to the plot and that they provided function and that they were able to you know oh their triples not liking klingons like reveals the traitor or the spy um i almost don't know how i feel about that like in some ways i'm like okay that's like the plot is like incorporated this 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 fun fun like silly aspect of these creatures is incorporated into the plot and it is significant but in some ways i'm like it doesn't need to be like i almost think they can it, just exist they can just exist like spock is all like oh they don't serve a purpose it's like okay that could be the case but by the end of the episode they still serve a purpose and and while i i think it's funny that then like that's what makes kirk come around to them too he's like oh you know maybe i like them after maybe all they're not so bad <laughs> yeah but even though I really enjoyed the episode and I and enjoyed the Tribbles, I almost thought that that was like the vision of the episode that I had in my head is a bit more, is more camp. And <laughs> just like, I, just imagine I, Tribbles everywhere. I also think that's what makes the ending of Trials and Tribulations so fun is that they're all like, oh, this is nothing to do with like our mission, but we just like brought a bunch of Tribbles <laughs> to our ship, to the future just just because we like them <laughs> yeah that that is true and i think 
one of the funniest things that since I mean you guys haven't seen Deep Space Nine so you, you wouldn't know is that the character that becomes so infatuated them with them on Deep Space Nine is Odo who's technic- who's usually the super serious like he's the they call him Constable Odo he's like the head of security on the station and he's so serious and he follows the law and a moral code and all of that and he's the one <laughs> that becomes obsessed with tribbles and like floods the station with them at the end um which i think is also very funny um, i also don't know if we've mentioned one of my favorite shots from the deep space nine episode yet which is when they teleport the bomb tribble into space and we just see <laughs> it floating there for a moment and then there's the huge like explosion <laughs> Yeah, I almost expect it. I don't remember if they do this, but like, like a shot back to like Kirk or some or someone being like, huh? <laughs> no, they should have. They don't. I mean, that would have been so funny. Yeah, I feel like it would have been impossible because they don't have that in the original episode, but just have like a like a turning his head moment. Well, OK, how did they get the, the thing that was more than just like splicing into the background? at least it seemed, was the moment where Cisco actually interacts with Kirk. Like, that must yeah. have been just leftover footage or something? Or yeah, like from or a- from another episode or something like that. Yeah. yeah. It, it was just, yeah. I, I do think that that moment is, like, such a pure expression of mm-hmm. just, like, love and gratitude for not just, like, the characters, but just, like, the concept of the original series mm-hmm. and how it is, like the fact that it's unnecessary to the mission and that he like he brings it up to the time the temporal association or whatever those time people who (laughs) he's describing to and like the fact that i don't know i feel like sometimes with things that are like fan service like in in conversations like the new star wars stuff it's like (laughs) we get to bring in this this character this artifact that everyone loves from the original stuff and it, it then something hinges on it you know it becomes important or or significant where i appreciate the moments of fan service that are just it is what it is it's like yeah cisco gets to say it was an honor serving with you kirk and that's it and that's all it needs to be um i think is really fun and i mean in the end they're not doing that for the audience they're doing it because cisco wants to meet captain kirk yeah cisco's the one who's a fan of captain kirk he wants to have that moment and he doesn't care whether the temporal authority uh, writes him up for it well not exactly before we left i realized there was one last thing i had to do Something I'd been thinking about ever since I saw that ship on the view screen. Excuse me, Captain. Here's tomorrow's duty roster for your approval. Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant... Benjamin Sisko, sir. I've been on temporary assignment here. Before I leave, I just want to say... It's been an honor serving with you, sir. Speaking of fans, I feel like that brings us to one of the the last things that you shared with us um the you shared the fan lore page for the dancing penises i sure did i think that's one of my favorite bits of star trek fan history um because it is so crazy and the fact that this happened, I don't I don't remember what year it happened, but like it was like the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. And and everyone was just okay with it. And that's like it's just that Star Trek is in Star Trek IRL spaces have always been kind of like I don't know, messed up like that. And I mean, in a good way. Um, and kind like, of like I feel like if people did that now, it would just be like heavily discoursed. <laughs> yes. But yeah, and I, I, I mean, I, I also see it, like, I remember a very long time ago, I saw a post about how a lot of women in fandom spaces, especially, do drag in cosplay without even realizing that it's drag, in a way, and I feel like that's a, and they were talking about how this is a prime example of that, because you have women 
becoming the symbol of the, you know, the hegemonic symbol of manhood um, in its most pure form. And like, you know, not really discussing, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean for us as cisgender women to, you know, become these penises? Giant penises? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there, <laughs> there's so much to think about, but it's so camp and like the explanation of how they made them and how they had to fit them in the taxi and how it was kind of it just like kind of gross how like the skit went and I don't know it was I think it's just so funny and iconic um so yeah what what do you guys think well I just I think that's it's so so fun when talking about camp especially for in around pieces of media that have um such like deep fandom how camp can arise not just from the media itself but from like fan practices and fan like like memes i guess and like that i don't even really know what to say about it because it's so it's it's uh, very just human beings are camp yeah and like it it re it reminds me of like when we recorded the supernatural episode we just started talking about um castiel being gay and homophobic during the 2020 election and like that's an incredibly camp thing that wasn't entirely textual it was mostly just fandom and like the circumstances of the 2020 election <laughs> yeah absolutely i think when you are a fan who wants who wants to explore these ideas from a piece of fiction and you you don't have to worry about like say a network or something that like showrunners have to you really have free reign to express yourself in whatever way you want um i think there's such great joy in that but also yeah it can also produce things that are um not doesn't seemingly self-aware like giant sculpted penises dancing around yeah i mean obviously when you read it and you t and you th and you see what like these women were saying they're like they're they're self-aware to an extent they they're like oh it was funny but i mean there's also like just the genuine like passion and uh not seriousness but like thought that went into it very much elevates it to camp perhaps naive camp um but yeah i think just looking at like convention culture and like early cosplay culture is just so fascinating because people were doing what they could with the resources they had um so you get a lot of camp value out of that i believe everything about spurk and or kirk spock um is very camp in my opinion uh, yeah i think i genuinely got like a bit a little emotional in that in the end there of of amok time where it's like when we get to see spock so happy he's like Kirk, like you're you're alive and then it's immediate and then but then it's like it's not that he he doesn't have emotion it's that then he hides that emotion because he sees that they're looking at him and it's like well that was just a completely logical answer to to, yeah. to knowing i haven't lost my captain but it's like Absolutely. oh that's so sweet yeah um Oh, there's a clip from the animated series, which is like a spinoff of the original series, which very low budget animation is pretty bad. Um, and there's a clip where like Spock kind of hugs Kirk awkwardly from the side and goes, or like Kirk does it to Spock and he's like, my good friend, Spock. Like, it, it's just so, <laughs> it's so, ooh. Oh, it's mm -hmm. perfect. It's perfect. Um, and then there's just so many other scenes that are like, if you look at them through a queer lens of shipping, it's like, wow. Um, that being said, I'm not the biggest Spurk shipper in the world, if I do say so myself. I really like the relationship of Bones and Spock 
which is slight, some people might say it's problematic since Bones is kind of xenophobic towards Vulcans, but I don't know. There's something about it. I think it's more fun than Spurk. I, I do, I do, I, I do see what you mean there because I also part of the fun of that that final moment is the is then Bones just being like, oh yeah, it's perfectly mm-hmm. logical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so logical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, again, a lot of the camp value of Spurk comes from early shipping content of them, not from the show itself, but from fans. Um, I think my friend Balin sent me like this old like 70s fan fiction like Spurk fan fiction once that was crazy to read it was very it was like like I I I can't even explain it it was <laughs> it was like they go to a planet where only men live and they're all naked all the time and they have a ceremony it, it, like very phallic symbolism and all this crazy stuff and, and and I feel like that's changed so much over time but and now looking back we're like <laughs> get a load of these guys um <laughs> I, I, I almost wonder if that 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 the thing that we've been talking about with like um old Star Trek knows how to have fun and new Star Trek has to take itself seriously. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that's somewhat also like, has that evolution been in fan culture as well? I think partially. Um, I think one of my friend's theories on fan culture is like the worse that the media is the more fan work there will be about it if it has a fandom because like a lot of shows that are good they're not gonna have like that the show accomplishes anything that a fan would want it to accomplish it's not gonna have a ton of fan fiction about it because the show just gives it to you have but you seen i feel the, like that's the so, chart like i think i have but i i was, I was gonna say that i feel like that's one of the reasons why it's so weird that like Succession has a fandom since it's regarded as a really good show and yet it has like this massive fandom and there's fan art everywhere. That's why I've seen like the 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 four quadrant chart where it's 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 like good to bad and then like Mm -hmm. um focused to expansive because Mm. if there's like you it can be really good like but if they doesn't show you everything or like you only you you know there's a lot of depth to characters but it's not like all that that is explored or like one of my favorite fan works a crown of candy from dimension 20 which i think is like a for the most part, a really solid season, but it's like this really interested world building that provides like the space for people to to dig into it. Um, yeah. And of course, you can't forget the availability of two shippable guys. <laughs> yep. Which Star Trek has in Bound in the original series. There's just one thing, Mr. Spock. You can't tell me that when you first saw Jim alive that you weren't on the verge of giving us an emotional scene that would have brought the house down. Merely my quite logical relief that Starfleet had not lost the highly proficient captain. Yes, Mr. Spock, I understand. Thank you, Captain. Of course, Mr. Spock, your reaction was quite logical. Thank you, Doctor. And a pig's eye. Oh gosh. Is there any, are we, we're so off topic now. Is there any last things that we should, um, we want to get in here? Um, I don't know. I, I think I want to reiterate that I haven't seen the newest Star Trek show, Strange New Worlds, but many people have said that it's kind of a return to kind of bringing, it's bringing the fun back to Star Trek and has like a lot of episodes where they do time travel or like they kind of, like fully are in costume and like do silly things and all of that. So I'm very excited to watch the show um, eventually and see for myself if it is returning to like the camp of Star Trek. Um, I think the problem with a lot of New Trek is that it happens around the same time period of the original series, but it's just so aesthetically different and like not like it's not trying to be similar to the original series which not only kind of bugs me 
because they're like missing the point of the original series while trying to be in the same time period of it but also just visually like they go like strange new worlds happens what like 10 years before the original series and it looks super high tech and everything and they're gonna go from like touch screens and like blah 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 blah, blah to like gumdrop buttons on the <laughs> if you go through the timeline and yeah. I mean fine sure fine whatever but I, I wish that they would put a little more effort into trying to make things look like they do on the original series because even though it was cheap as hell and just plastic glued onto other plastic it looked better it looks better <laughs> it looks like interactable mm -hmm. do you have any closing thoughts Fabiola to me, I, I'm just still like thinking about the classic Star Trek colors. Like, I just love them. There's something about them. <laughs> yeah. More planets with like red wine skies. It wasn't even like red wine. It was just like bright blue based red. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I, the other day I saw a Tumblr photo set that was like a shot of the TOS set and next to like the Teletubby set <laughs> and, they, and like and like different angles and stuff and and like the caption was like original Star Trek is so Teletubby's core and it's true and it looks fun and I love it. Um, yeah, bring back sets, bring back colors, and bring back sexy little dresses <laughs> sure yeah bring back put the sex back in star trek that's what i'm always you know a lot of people were talking about that and i think that's one of the things that people really like about strange in worlds is that the characters fuck <laughs> Ooh, good for them good for them uh which a lot of new like in discovery like yeah michael has sex with a couple people but it's never like you know sexy it's just like mm, okay i guess um <laughs> Make someone so horny they have to fight to the death. So true. Make it so in Deep Space Nine, Quark, the character with ears who I love, he that's a neurogenous zone for his alien race, and he gets his ears fondled like every fucking episode, <laughs> and he moans, and it's disgusting, and I want it back. I will put that back in Star Trek. Make it weird and gross again, please. I'm begging. All right, I think that's a wonderful <laughs> place to end. That is a wonderful place to end. Where can where can people find you, Amparo? Find me on Twitter at at Amparapa. Figure out how to spell that. A M P A R. No, I can't spell it out loud. Um, <laughs> we'll we'll link it on our Twitter. Link it, link it, uh, and then on TikTok at Polar Orange Dry, one word. What do you post on TikTok? My art. Oh, nice. Yeah. So yeah. And yeah, that's that's it. You can find us on Twitter at Giving Camp Pod and on Instagram at It's Giving Camp Pod. And that's all lowercase one word. Our theme music that you are listening to right now is by Harrison Worry. I'm Saffron Heftegal, and I'm online at Galb Hefta. And I'm Fabiola Liano, and you can find me on Twitter at Fabiola underscore Liano. Shout out to our patron, Nicole Veneto. Thank you so much for listening, and if you enjoy our podcast, please recommend it to your friends, and give us a rating on Wine. <laughs>